welcome everybody and thank you for joining us and um so i just to give you an idea of why we decided to put this this webinar together this what we call a mini masterclass together is uh, first and foremost because we're actually running a series of leadership masterclass um, sessions with with leaders across the world actually um and part of this is number one to discuss what that looks like and 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 how it can benefit leaders you know in their roles but mainly specifically at this time of the year it's been a really harrowing year for a lot there's been such a huge amount of change there's huge amount of global events going on geopolitically post covid um even you know cost of living crisis economy wise there's there's a massive amount and i actually went to a future of work conference uh, last week i sat on the panel of one of the um the discussion points where we we got a bunch of um chief people officers to really discuss the future of work and how um what is what is the people functions role in actually helping to shape the the future of work and 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 helping to shape how leaders navigate this uncertainty and transition and volatility so i actually said i said to jackie who's who's one of the she's the facilitator of the leadership masterclasses that we're running i said i think it would be a really good idea at the end of the year to actually run a, a mini masterclass for people who are maybe interested in signing up for themselves in terms of their own leadership capabilities and really discuss i guess some of the challenges that leaders can exp are experiencing some of the mistakes they're maybe making with their people um and and maybe for her just to give you an overview of little nuggets that she 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 sort of gleans and and provides insights for during the masterclass sessions which is a really nice sort of way to end the year out and maybe think about next year january where we'll be holding a new um series of masterclass sessions so that's just my thinking around sort of having this masterclass um it's mini it's it's an hour so it shouldn't take up a lot of time um, but we obviously want you to, if there are questions that come up in between, things that resonate with you, then um, I would just encourage you to use the chat function to ask those questions or to try and hold on to your questions until towards the end of the webinar where we will have a QA and a um, for people that really want to kind of get more dive deeper into some of the things. So um, without further ado, I'm going to just hand over to Jack who's going to just give you a broad overview of Jackie's been a leadership development consultant for 25 years plus. She's done a huge amount of work for um, a lot of the big corporates um, globally and also private equity space. Um, my experience spans mainly across the small business tech sector. Um, so the two of us are actually working together on on providing this for leaders globally. And um, I just think that with her insights, we, we couldn't pass up the opportunity. So welcome everybody, and I'm gonna hand over to Jackie. Thanks, Candice. Um, welcome guys, thank you so much for logging on. Um, I think what Candice has positioned is incredibly powerful in closing out the year with so much happening globally, um, you know, locally, globally, across so many dimensions, whether we're talking legal, whether we're talking political, whether we're talking economic, whether we're talking um, world events, there's just a huge amount of stuff happening in our world of work. Um, and I think the space that we find ourselves in has probably been accelerated by the coronavirus that obviously um, broke out early 2020, because I think the conversations that we're having now would probably have happened further down the line. And I think that the COVID virus and what's happened to the world of work and what's happened to the world um, has been impacted by the onset of the pandemic. Um, I think it's the most pertinent topic right now in the world of work is how are we navigating this very complicated, this very fast moving, this very ever evolving landscape. Um, and, and that is in the masterclasses that Candace has spoken to, the overriding objective of how we are, we've approached the design of this is wondering how we can equip leaders 
with the ability to respond to what's going on. And I think the word respond is very important and what I want you to hold. So part of the work that I've done for so many years, and I don't think it's ever been more pertinent and more on my radar screen, is working with individuals who work in organizations, whether you're working with your teams, whether you're working with clients and stakeholders, you're working with other, right? Um, and I think the complication of this new world that we're living in is there's such a heightened state of tech and heightened state of using artificial intelligence and a heightened state of robotics and getting things to happen for you um, that it almost minimizes the human component and the role that human beings play in organizations. But the other side of it is, is actually organizations are made up of human beings and human beings are complicated. Human beings are human. Human beings come with a host of quirks and difficulties and complexities that actually in order to be successful in this day and age in the world of work um, or in the world of organizations and when I say organizations and I want you to hold this it could be your family organizational system as well so this domain spans the world of work and your personal home story because families are also systems and organizations made up of characters who engage and come with complexity and you do need to work out how to navigate that space and i am chuckling because we probably could go tangent on navigating difficult family human dynamics but that's not for this masterclass. we could maybe set one up for another time um but as i said in today's evolving landscape being a great leader is no longer about simply managing teams or driving revenue. Of course, that's essential because for organizations to endure, they need to make money and you did, you know, you need to have people doing the right things properly um, and not putting organizations at risk and not um, making foolish decisions that are going to compromise people's jobs and um, revenue streams. So it's not that management's not important. Management remains critical through this whole process, but I don't think managers are the concept or the theme of discussion in navigating the new landscape that we found ourselves in. Um, and so you can see on this first slide, and we've also minimized the number of slides because I'm really not a fan of slides. I prefer dialogue um, and conversations and debate and questions. And so we're really going to encourage you as part of this webinar to bring what's on your mind and anything that we say that might probe something um, or create an insight in you or make you stumble upon something that you really want to talk about, please raise it because that's what makes these kind of conversations and webinars that much more interesting. Um, but what we know is that there is something pivotal around preparation and preparing for an unpredictable future, right? We know that the world that we're living in is going to continue to change. It changes every other minute. And we as, um, I guess, humans, but also as leaders, have to respond to it. So I want you to hold the words that I'm using. This is around response, okay? This is about working with and leaning into, not just going with. Because I think if you just go with something, it's going to shoot you down the stream in the direction that it wants you to go. And you're going to have no control over how you are going. Um, and it might take you into a place where there's a giant waterfall that's going to send you pounding down to the rocks. I mean, that's where streams end, right? Or where things kind of come to an end. There's generally something that ends it or makes it more dangerous um, or makes it more rough. Um, so I want you to hold on to the word respond. And um, without, you know, if I had a flip chart in front of me, which maybe we can do for another webinar, I want to ask you guys a question. The opposite of the word response is reaction, right? Because reaction is, is you're just reacting to something. Um, reaction indicates less thinking, less working with. It's just almost like an automatic thing that happens to us. The way we are structured anatomically and with our brains is that our brain is the most fascinating structure. Our brains are designed to work with different things. Within our brain, we've got different parts, right? We do have different um, complicated brains that have grown over the years of evolution. If you think about the human brain and if you think about yourself, you've got a very reactionary brain, right? Now, remember, our instinctual reactionary brain is absolutely linked to protection to 
moving with something and you'll often have heard the words flight or fight, right? So something scares you or something threatens you, there's going to be an automatic reaction to what you're going to do about that. You're either going to, if somebody's threatening you, launch at them and fight or try and protect yourself. You could similarly know that the threat's too big and you might retreat and go and hide behind a rock because it's going to protect you. For a lot of people, we don't know what to do, so we just freeze. But that's an automatic process that is driven by our brains and the workings of our body. So when adrenaline pumps through us because we're scared or we're anxious of something going to hurt us or harm us, we automatically react. Where we want to get to is obviously reaction is important and there is protection mechanisms and survival of the fittest and all that good stuff that we know about is valid and is there for a reason. But if I were to ask you to write the word reaction on a piece of paper in front of you, if you've got a piece of paper, or go into your brains and play with the letters, if you were to reorganize the word reaction into a different word using every single letter, what word do you think would come out? Are you waiting for somebody to answer you <laughs> or is everybody still busy? Well, I mean, if anybody's got something, throw it out. That's the request or raise your hand or do what online webinar thingies offer us. You could have started with an easier word. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> There's method in my madness. <laughs> um, creation. That's it. So that's exactly the word. If you use every single letter to reconfigure the word reaction. It moves you from a state of reacting to something to the possibility of what you can work with and what can emerge if you spend a little bit of time holding that, right? And the space of creation and possibility is really where this leadership work has been so exciting for me. The premise is that we do suffer from a human condition called being human. We all do like to deal with things like comfortable and safe, right? Because again, if you think about, again, the analogy I gave you of something threatening you when your body starts pumping adrenaline and cortisol, that's what activates your reaction time, right? You don't think about stuff, you just launch. And we uh, launching is what we all will do because we're human, right? But if you are working with something in a very, very responsible way, and in a responsive way, um, that is where you are able to do something that is leaning into what's going on and working with what is. Okay, so that is why the word reaction to creation is so absolutely imperative here, because as I said, with the ever evolving landscape and having to work with this unpredictable world, the reality is, is the unpredictable and the the chaos of it, what is scary about it is it's unknown, right? Whereas a lot of the management stuff is known and safe and predictable. And safe and predictable people like because we like to be safe. We like to know. Again, our body calms physiologically and anatomically with what's pumping through it when we feel safe. When we feel more relaxed about stuff because it's known, we're coming off quite a good base. So we almost seek comfort. We seek habit. We seek things that make us safe, right? The challenge with that is that the landscape that we're living in is so unpredictable and ever-changing that we actually have to learn to work with not feeling comfortable or taking risks or stepping out of comfort zone or really confronting ourselves with habits that are not serving us so that we can respond to what's going on with us. And that is the space that we're playing in with the leadership masterclasses and with this webinar is asking you to think around how am I working with this reality, right? And the idea of future-proofed leadership is Ironically, even though you're talking about the future, which hasn't happened yet, the imperative for leaders is how are we future proofing our organizations so that we can continually respond to so much stuff that is happening in the world of work, right? Um, and that's why, again, it's exciting for us 
working with what the, the world's thrown. So a long while ago when Candace said to me, let's do online leadership masterclasses, I as a leadership consultant, facilitator and coach pushed back immediately and said, oh my gosh, you can't do this. In order to do leadership work, you have to be in a process room with people. You have to be in person. You have to build rapport. You have to connect. All the have tos, right? So we kind of put a lot of pressure on ourselves because I know it works. I've done enough workshops over the last 23 years to know the magic of in person. But the world has thrown us a new universe, a new dimension where everyone is online, working remotely, blending their working conditions. You're dealing with hybrid. You are having access to social media and information is massively being thrown at you. And there's a lot going on for us. So you almost can't negate the fact that that is where the world is going. So for me, there was Candace confronting my deeply held beliefs and habit of you have to be in a process room in order to do leadership development and in order to grow your leadership muscle. What I'm learning is actually you can do one or the other. You can blend it. You can work with people much broader than your geographical location. And so suddenly the possibility of the consulting work that I've been doing in my consultancy, which, yes, started off in organizations and the investment banking world for 14, 15 years, then leaving that and going into another stratosphere of, you know, mining, consulting, packaging, tolling systems and infrastructure, completely different to bankers, right? And then saying, well, actually, let's work with the space that we're in, which is about possibility and working with a disparate group of individuals across a, a much broader reach. I think the exciting thing that I'm saying is there is so much possibility in the world that we're living in, but there's also a whole lot that is scary, that is draining us, that is messing with our well-being, that is messing with um, brilliant concepts like culture. I mean, culture is the most fantastic conversation, but how do you work with organizational culture if some organizations have now elected to not be in person and to be remote because we know people can work from home? which is what COVID gave us. So I think that that's the exciting part of the world that we're living in and what we want to open up as part of this thinking process and this well, you know, this webinar um, dialogue session is how do we work with what is whilst retaining what is important and works and blending it in a way where we are responding to what's being presented to us. Just in closing what I have to say, um, and, you know, for those of you that are sportsmen, there's a little bit of a spin-off on this. But in a lot of the leadership work that I've done, there is the pushing people in organizations who are making decisions around investing in development opportunities to grow our leaders, to grow our people so that they can be more effective. Sometimes you work on the case of, oh, well, it was lucky, right? I just knew how to deal with this or I reacted to this properly or I responded to this in a good way, or, but it isn't as worked with. And there's a brilliant philosopher called Seneca who said, actually, it's not about luck. In this space particularly, luck is what happens when opp uh, opportunity um, collides meets, or meets, meets preparation. preparation. <laughs> You know, and that's the interesting thing for me. It is when opportunity, which is what presents to you, meets the preparation and the investment that you've put in to growing your leadership muscle, to working with yourself, to confronting yourself, to really putting yourself in a position so that you're going to be able to respond to what is coming your way. And because of that, you're going to be more successful with how you navigate. So that's the premise and the philosophy that we are driving with the leadership masterclasses and with the in-person leadership work that we are doing. How can organizations be responsible to not set up their people who are in leadership roles? And I am using the word leadership, interestingly, because, yes, people are often from a title perspective or from a rank perspective put into a position of manager or team lead or account lead or, you know, um, board member, whatever the role might be, where you've got to work with people in a way where you bring magic from a leadership perspective. But there is a lot of management component to the role. The exciting part for me is if you are giving people the opportunity to effectively go to gym and work these leadership muscles and my other words that are essential qualities for future-proofed leaders would be visionary thinking 
you know, because there's a Japanese proverb that says vision without action is a dream and action without vision is a nightmare. So it's something to hold in how visionary our leaders being. The emotional intelligent piece is incredibly important. And although it's bandied around as almost like a, um, a tagline or something that everybody uses, there is something very powerful around knowing that emotional intelligence is a key to success, both personally and professionally. And that EQ is rapidly outpacing IQ. And again, think about artificial intelligence and access. We've got to very intelligent things, you know, so you need to know something. You can Google it. You can come up with the answer in five seconds and it's intelligent. But how you are working with that from an emotional intelligence perspective, um, it's been proven that emotional intelligence, not IQ, fosters better team cohesion, handling of crises better, better conflict resolution, because the most intelligent person in the room is not going to be effective in dealing with conflict necessarily, or getting two people to work together, or creating a safe space for people to thrive and perform exponentially. So another quality that's essential for future-proof leadership is that emotional intelligence piece, is that inclusive leadership, working with the very difficult space of diversity, which again, as we know today, is quite challenging because everything has got a platform and there are hundreds of movements backing diversity, um, the, the spectrum of diversity fields, right? Whether we're talking about age, whether we're talking about race, whether we're talking about religion, whether we're talking about sexual orientation, everywhere has got a platform that is now being authorized to speak. And so as a leader working with this, and it's hard and it's scary, is essential, right? And then this can go on to speaking around the importance of continually learning and almost being a scholar of perpetual learning and the importance of ethical decision-making and your moral compass and having a global mindset and ensuring that you're empowering so that. Um, and of course, the end of it is that you are a resilient character so that you can get up when you get knocked down. So there's a whole... You're on mute, Jack. Yeah, Jackie. Yeah. Just press mute by mistake. <laughs> Touch screen. Is that better? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. I think my mouse knocked the mute button. Um, so just some words that I want you to hold on to. And again, I said language is incredibly, incredibly important in this leadership space. And it's a thread that goes through, again, in-person leadership development as well as online masterclasses, as well as coaching people one on one. There is something around in order to future proof your organization, it is leading from the front. But I want you to look at the words that are on the slide, because I could have actually added to future proof to future proofing your organization, leading from the front. The ING word speaks not to the future and what you're trying to achieve, not to the past and what you bring in terms of your experience or your, um, you know, your life lessons or things that have served you or scuppered you that you know about that you can use, because the past is what's happened and the future is what could happen. The magic in the space is the now. That is something that I would like you to really hold as part of these leadership. I mean, this um, webinar around, you know, future proofing your organization. It's a now thing and it's a what are you doing now thing. So how are you leading from the front? How are you leading others? How are you leading change? How are you um, engaging with conflict? Right. How are you holding the picture so it's not reductionistic like management is and about tasks and outputs and ticking boxes and, you know, what do I need to do? How are you thinking holistically and creating a picture for your people so that it is something bigger that has momentum that can drive them towards something? How are you creating a conscious culture? And again, conscious culture is around being mindful. It's around seeing. When you are conscious, you see stuff, right? Human beings by virtue of the way we are um, socialized and we grow up and we go through stuff, we are, and as a, we could go into psychology here and speak about Sigmund Freud and the fact that we've all got an unconscious and we bring that unconscious with us. The unconscious is important because there's something that you can work with when you get in touch with it. But the push is to make things conscious so you can be more deliberate with how you are doing things and working with stuff. So again, 
working with consciously creating a culture in your organization so that the things that are happening, whether it is remote and whether it is in an office, is part of how people do things because our culture embraces this. Um, and again, something to hold as a leader, how are you working with culture if you've got people in an office and people online? So there's now the marriage of a virtual culture marrying an in-person culture, organizational culture, right? So I think that that's the exciting part of it for me and the work that I do. But again, in the space that you are working in and working with people in your organizations to hold these kind of things top of mind. It is around having an exponential mindset rather than a reductionistic minimizing one, right? Because when you create boundaryless stuff, um, things just expand and you've got access to so much more. How do we harness this human potential? How do we realize it? Because even if, and, and my hope is that it doesn't go there because I really don't want to be part of the world of robots like you see Will Smith running around with those robots that are causing chaos. That scares me big time. But I'm hoping that human beings stay on our radar screen and are part of our world of work, right? Forever. Because there's magic in human. There's complexity, but life is seriously not boring when you're dealing with human. Robots, not so much. Robots, we download stuff and they execute impeccably to the exact T of how we want them. To. That's not reality at the moment. So, yes, you can optimize, and this is the management piece, your, con your organization with systems and processes and policies and everything or automating to get things to be done quicker or all these great words that we're dealing with in the world of work. Right. But important things like decision making and risk consciousness and having robust conversations that serve and that actually confront and that's a human process that's very much a human process so how do we keep human being human working with human navigating human very much on my ra radar screen as leading from the front how do we work with mindset change and i think that that's the other thing that's so hard change is hard guys we want safe we want to keep known in check but we don't have a choice here. We have to keep responding to change. So how do we work with our mindset? How do we work with the mindsets of our people in order to navigate an ever-changing, ever-evolving, fast-paced um, world? And then, as I said, self-awareness remains at the heartbeat of future-proofing your organization. The premise is that the more in tune I am with me and the more aware I am about myself, the better I am in dealing with other people. OK, so that lives at the heartbeat again of the leadership journey and self-awareness is hard because self-awareness also requires me confronting myself around what I'm doing that's serving and continuing to do it because it's working, but also challenging myself and saying, well, what are you doing that's not helping you? What are you doing that's tripping things up? What are you doing that's not enabling or empowering others to do this? And owning it. And the second you own something and you can work with it, even if it makes you feel uncomfortable, is where the true growth um, and that exponential explosion of possibility lives very large. Um, I've got a phenomenal slide on the next, the next slide from this. But the other thing that's so important is, are our people engaged with the world of work or are they disconnected? We run the risk of people being remote and online a lot of the time now that they do check out and tune out. You know, when you aren't in person with people and you can't see when someone's having a good day loaded with a lot of work or whatever it might be, we're a lot more further away from it. So we don't engage with it. And somebody's a lot more alone and in their own isolated space. And I think that that's what COVID did, which people battled with. You were suddenly stripped of social and connection and being able to do what was so normal. And people had to sit in their own skin and grapple with a lot of stuff on their own or in their own bubble. And that is hard. So isolation from or feeling abandoned or feeling lonely or not part of or any of those words which psychologically impact on us in terms of our well-being plays out in organizations and is a risk given this new world that we're living in. Okay, so are our people engaged and are our people present? Because the management thing is, is who's absent? We can measure that, right? So when people don't come to work and you can know that they're not at work, it's easy to work with. We can address or have a conversation with why people are being absent. Our bigger risk to thriving and to optimizing this workspace is when people are showing up at work and are present 
but are actually not giving their all or actually not bringing what they can or actually not um, aha in their passion to really make things work. And the whole idea of presenteeism is much more risky than absenteeism. It's quite easy to deal with people who are absent. It's very hard to deal with people who are sitting at work in their chair. So you can't fault them for being there, but they're not bringing it. And then a very important thing, which I know we did position as an important part of this webinar, is employee well-being. People are taking strain. I can own after the year that I've had, which has been one of the most brutal years of my life, I am running off a low base and I'm running on empty. And the important thing for you to hold as leaders is how are you ensuring that you're looking after your own well-being so that you can then engage with your people and ensure that their well-being is under control and also you're pushing them to be in control of their well-being and that you are holding the space of the, organiz the organization's well-being. So it's almost like a systemic interrelated process, but it starts with you looking after yourself and role modeling, looking after yourself. It starts with you giving your people messages around the importance of them looking after themselves, right? And that is your role of leader. You can't make sure that they're doing it, but you can make sure that you're doing it for yourself and you can make sure you're giving them messages of that it's important for them to do it for themselves. because. The reality is, is things like burnout, psychological distress, depression, um, suicide, all of these very scary things are a very, very real part of people breaking and burning out and cracking. And that is, again, something to hold about the risk of online. I think we, when we are online, at least when we're in an office, we kind of wake up in the morning, have breakfast get dressed for work and go to work. So we leave our home and our home life and our home role and cap. And then we step into our organization and then we put on our organizational work role cap, right? And then when we leave that, we then maybe go to gym and then we maybe go home. And so we're changing our caps. Whereas when you're online and when you're at home, you're wearing your work cap, your family cap, your mother cap, your father cap, your um, I've got to look after the house cap. Uh, you you be gymming at home now. That's another thing that COVID did. So suddenly I'm not actually wearing, or I'm not checking out of these spaces. And so I'm in constant run. And that is a risk, guys. Constantly running is dangerous because constantly running means no thinking, no breathing, no well-being, no seeing, no feeling. We just automate and actually become those awful robots that I said I don't want to live in a world with. And the thing is with those robots, by the way, if you don't oil them and make sure that you change the wires and upload the right programs and whatever you might do that robots need, they will break. Because I don't even think robots are infallible. There's something that we need to hold around the well-being space and how it lives at the heart of this journey. The more whole I am, the more whole I can be for other and for the organization. And then obviously the words of thrivability, which we have spoken around in artificial intelligence. And that is the picture that I want you to hold from this um, webinar. Um, it's so important that we are able to strike a match so we can spark something and create the flame, but ensure that the whole match doesn't get burnt out. And so we spat out at the end of the day. And that is linked to the heart and the responsibility of this leadership journey. And that's really um, something that I want you to hold from a future proof in your organization. As I said, the work that we do in this leadership space and what's important is that I'm constantly working with what is. Because if I'm constantly seeing things, hearing things, feeling things, and thinking about things, and I create a space to put leadership on my radar screen, I'm going to be better placed to respond to stuff. I'm going to pick up more stuff than I would if I was just running. And that is, again, the positioning of the leadership masterclasses is how can we be much more present and in tune and conscious so that we can be more effective in the driving of the space that we want to create and the looking after our people. Okay, so that's my long story long. Thoughts? Has anything that I've said um, 
collided with thoughts that you've already had or is there anything new that's been presented that might have made you nod or think gosh you know gosh that's pertinent what are your thinking and thoughts about that because i'd rather close this presentation and open it up to a conversation yeah i think we can close <clears throat> we can close it off the, the presentation if you finished with it but um unless you want to go through that towards the end well, but i think just from yeah. a question point of view i mean i've got maybe something that I've been seeing with a lot of the leaders that I work with and, and one of the things we alluded to is what do you think are some of the so you speak about a state of being and you speak about kind of a way in which to future proof and those words that are really pivotal and important but what do you think some of the mistakes are that people maybe um, fall into you know not consciously because they're just running or they're running on empty or they're burnt out or, you know, so so they're they're kind of a, opening themselves up, I suppose, to mistakes, not willingly, but they just kind of fall in it. From a leadership perspective, what are some of those mistakes or some of those risks that that everybody on the call can maybe watch out for? from a leadership perspective and i'm talking about you know going through growth in an organization when you when you're growing quite heavily and quite quickly or when you've got an organization that's also quite um gen z focused so and i say gen z because you know we, we've got a very different person coming through into the workplace now as opposed to what we did have and what we maybe are used to um what do you think some of those mistakes are, some of the risks are for leaders? Um, so, I mean, I think the biggest risk is a blindness or not owning that I'm feeling stuff and I'm experiencing stuff and I'm not I'm not stopping or I'm not taking stock of it in a way that I press the po It's the confronting myself that I'm running so hard or I'm doing so much that um, I'm not taking care of myself or I'm not giving the right amount of time to, or I've got to create the time. I think I think a mistake, and I'll say leaders, but let's just talk around people for the, 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 you know, the purpose of this conversation. I do think people think that they're quite invincible and I can keep going and I keep going. And I think that we do give ourselves those messages. I think we rash I think that that's the rational process. I think we we know this is going to be fine and I can just get through this and I and it is fine because in a certain amount of time if there is a need to run and to put out fires, you can do that and it's absolutely appropriate to step into that space and work for a week or two weeks or a month having to get a transaction over the finish line and there's deadlines and you can do it for a certain amount of time but you can't do it as a consistent. This is my script of life story, because that is going to trip you up. At some point, you're going to fall over. And I'll own it. I know for me that I can keep running and I can keep running. And until I actually collapse or get sick or something happens to me, I don't listen to the very, very, I mean, I can, my body's keeping the score, right? So I, mm -hmm. I can tell when I'm tired, but you kind of push beyond it because you have to. And I think we hard on ourselves. I think we're I think we don't listen to ourselves enough. I think we've got expectations of other and expectations of ourselves where we just keep running and running and doing and doing. And then we think somebody wants us to do more and I don't want to let them down. And, and I think we let a lot of stuff happen when it's not that we're going to let people down, but I think if we worked with stuff in a more effective way, we'd create more space for ourselves to, to do things. Mm. And and so it's us almost confronting ourselves and, it, you know, yes, it's a mistake that maybe managers or leaders might make. And sometimes it's not even a conscious mistake. I think mm. I think it's how we get in touch with making certain things more conscious and more worked with. Yeah. But that does require a discipline to put them on our radar screen. So yeah, I think it's that consciousness because you, you speak about a state of being. So it's around the ING, the ING. Um, which I, you know, while you were talking, I put a, there is a state of being and it's about being present and in that moment rather than, I suppose, ironically, focused heavily on past or funnily enough, heavily on future. Yeah. Um, which ironically, we, we've we've kind of called the, the masterclass future proof. Mm -hmm. But actually that maybe the the trick is actually the to future proof, you have to focus on the now. 
or what is that like interesting balance between the now and the future? Because you've got to also be very conscious of the future. You've got to you've got to safeguard, you know, for ways in which you can optimize and make sure that you, your business doesn't run itself into the ground in the future. Totally, totally. And I mean, as you're speaking, and it is again part of the design of the leadership work that I do. It's really thinking about those indices of time. It's it's the most fascinating process because nobody's negating that the past isn't important, right? I mean, the past has shaped us. The past makes mm. us who we are. The past is that lovely line around, this is what makes me tick. So it's important, right? Um, and being in tune with that and being in tune with what makes me tick and my deeply held beliefs and the values that I've got and my work ethic and what is or isn't important to me and what I, all those things um, and what shaped me is imperative because if I'm in tune with it and I can share it with other people and they know that about me, it makes me authentic as a leader. And the people trust authenticity. They trust consistency. So past is important. So getting in touch with your past story as a leader is imperative. Like um, world leader. I'll, I'll use Nelson Mandela for the purposes of this because I think he is a brilliant example of that. But he very much, his, his leadership um, brand, for want of a better word, was definitely made up about his past and his story and the the history of his country and having to work with it and you know going to Robben Island and then getting released and becoming the first black president of South Africa that was his story and it made him who he was and people because they knew the story and because he was authentic in the struggle that he went through and people loved him and trusted him and got him because of his past he also created the dream of what he wanted from a future perspective for the country. So the future piece is no less important. We need future. We need dreams. We need aspirations. We need goalposts, right? But again, the past has happened. And so, as my grandmother used to say, it is what it is, right? The future is not happening. It's what you espouse or you would like it to look like, but it hasn't happened yet. And so it's almost like a bit of a pipe dream and it's and we need it. The human condition is people need dreams. People need things that pull them and aspirational stuff because it's going to mobilize their systems to do something amazing. But it hasn't happened yet. So what I love about the idea, and again, the future thing is around relevance, right? So you need to keep thinking about the future. And we've spoken around the fact that this future is, every, is happening, right? But you need to stay relevant because of that future thing. So. How do you declare what you want for the future or know what you're driving towards but aren't fixated on it? How have you learned from the past and hold on to the lessons that you've learned and learn from them? But how do you free yourself up? Because I think when we are fixated on a goalpost, we're sometimes so fixated on that goalpost that we don't see anything else. The same thing when we rooted and anchored in the past. We're so bogged down by the baggage that it just robs us of the ability to move or to lighten or to you know the message I want to leave you with when we get to the end of this master class well-being webinar website future proofing whatever the words might be that we've used is that you don't really have any power or control in past or future right you don't you can't make something happen you can do stuff that can hopefully make something happen but you can't control that it's going to happen you can learn from the past because they're lessons that have served you. They're scripts that might drive a lot of stuff. There's great stuff in the learning, but it's done. So it is what it is, is the past. It should be or it could be is amazing in the future. The question I want you to hold is what are you going to do about it? And the what you're going to do about it is now. And that's the exciting part of the space that you guys are in from a leadership perspective that really does excite me about this, the space that we are in. Because the premise is, is if I have my eyes open, if I'm more conscious and mindful, if I do create the space, and this is linked to your question around what mistakes people leaders make, right? So if I'm very deliberate and intentional 
with working in the now. And I'm not advocating that people need to, to work any harder because we don't want to add to what people are doing because that's not particularly useful. It's just going to make people feel more frazzled and burn out quicker and run more, right? But if you can, as a leader, challenge yourself and confront yourself to look for the moments in a week, maybe when you start the week or check out the week, that you're looking for the opportunity to influence, to impact, to lean into something, to risk something, to have a confronting conversation, to deal with a difficult individual, to look for the opportunity to take up the space and lead, that emergent process will probably drive you towards your goalpost in a much more stringent way. So that that is the the thing that is exciting for me. There's actually a lot of control, even though we feel like we don't have it. And even if we can't control something, by how we choosing to be, what we're choosing to say, when we're choosing to say it, to who, by when, in, you actually have got a lot more power than you think to work with what's emerging. Okay. And that's the thing that I want you to hold. It is looking for the opportunity to take yourself to gym and work that leadership muscle in a bit more of a deliberate way. That's the exciting part for me, because what I do know is if you do risk something or if you do try something new or if you do decide to have a conversation, even if you don't get the decision that you want, just by having that conversation or bringing something, you might create an insight or you might create a spark and something else can take place because of it. So I think that's the thing that I'd like you to have. Again, you know, the mistakes leaders make. I think the other thing, Candice, is avoiding dealing with stuff. That's mm -hmm. another thing that it's, it's it, we'll call it a mistake, but I don't even think you can call it a mistake. I think the human condition is we don't like conflict and we like to shy away from it. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So how can you work with it? Because sometimes even just leaning into something in the moment, even if it's hard and scary, is probably going to free you up of a lot of stuff that you're going to have to deal with if you don't lean into it. And I think that that's the thing that I want people to hold. It's not, you know, this 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 leadership journey for me, what's so exciting about it, I'll give you a metaphor. In the good old days of the 80s or 70s or when, you know, I used to get those break dancers come into the middle of a town square with the boom box on their shoulder or carrying their, their radio stereo set. And it, it's less applicable now because now we've just got nanopods that you can't see that sit in our pocket with AirPods. And so that's, it is a historic metaphor. But this leadership process and growing your leadership muscle is not about changing you. And I want you to hold that. It's around how do you, so you're not going to take this boom box apart and reconfigure it and paint it in a different color so it looks fundamentally different. We don't want that from a leadership perspective. We want you to play with the device. So you might need to, in order to be more impactful, turn up the volume, turn down the volume for some people, change the station because more people like pop than they like country or gospel. Um, you might need to play with the dials of bass and treble and fix the static so that the sound coming out of the device is much more melodious and clear. Can you, I mean, just get in touch with the leadership role that you're playing and the words that I'm using. There is so much power in the space of playing and working your leadership muscle that the exciting thing for me is what's possible when you're able to get this machine into a place where it lands with so much power and influence. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Because we've got a few more minutes and then maybe Jackie, you can just take people through the design of it. But I think let's just, if there are any other questions from anyone, if this has sparked anything or from you, anyone, then feel free to ask now. There's no, no questions, but a general comment. I mean, Jackie, I think you really hit on a lot of home truths here. And this is a lot of stuff, which has, I think, been, um, I think that certainly I've been thinking about for a long time, but not actually having the time to, you feel like you're on the treadmill all the time, and therefore you don't have the time really to just stop and and say, like, am I doing the right thing? You know, it's like alone time. It's time to 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 um, understand. It's almost like you're chopping a forest down, but you're not even sure if you're using the right forest. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's uh, just really so far this has been very very helpful so thank you so much 
Thank you. Any other comments or questions? No questions on the chat forum. All right. So then maybe Jack, just take the, everybody who's just used the last sort of two or three minutes just to take everybody through what the design of the masterclass um, sessions look like. Okay, so here where I am going to. So, I mean, I'm not going to go through in a huge amount of detail because we um, are pressed for time. Just tell me if that's the right slide because now my Teams has blinked and I've only got people's faces. Yes. I suppose it's. it's it's the objectives um, of I, leadership yeah. masterclass. Okay, so I'm not even going to really go through yeah. that in huge detail. You guys can read what's on the screen. Um, but effectively, what we have designed, and the idea of future proofing is so exciting because even though to future proof is a future, you know, there's a future orientated state, the important thing is how are you working through this process to do this? And that is how the design of the, um, the masterclasses has been conceptualized and how we've worked with it that you know it starts off with me and how am I leading me how am I leading myself as I said to you the heartbeat of this process is the more in tune I am with myself the better I am in dealing with other so as a starting off point it's getting in touch with myself and how am I leading myself um, and through that process we then move into the space between me and another so the first module is around leading self. The second one becomes more around leading others, but not leading others in the space of a team or a group, leading another person. And that becomes exciting in the space of um, communication, dealing with difficult conversations, the resistance that we're confronting. Um, how do I optimize my communication so that I can land messages? How do I work with resistance? How do I... Um, make effective decisions that factors in a whole bunch of stuff. But again, it's all built on me from the premises. If I'm in tune with myself and I'm able to confront myself and work with myself, then other is going to feel more in relationship with me because I'm more vulnerable. I'm more human. Um, I'm not just a role of CEO. I'm actually a person in the role. And so the, the, the masterclass process moves from the myself working with other and being more effective in the space between one and one and again the one-on-one -on -one space is the relationship space how do i optimize my relationships how do i ensure that i work relationships because what i know and this does speak to my previous life in a corporate world for 15 years relationships are currency the relationships are power and my hope is that regardless of what happens in this tech world and artificial intelligence world and world of you know, access to information in any given moment, that human relationships still remain sacred and imperative. Um, so how am I working with that relationship space? How am I working with nurturing the relationships that are working and are good? So how do I keep those in check and not drop them? And how do I work with the ones that are more difficult? And we can all own that we've got relationships in our lives, whether at work or whether on the home can front. I push you? I'm that are tricky. Yeah. We, we've got we've got another minute. And then the final part of it is if I'm working with those relationships, how do I speak, you know, then move into the space of bigger? How do I move into the space of organization? How do I work with organizational culture? How do I work with um, taking up the leadership space, creating vision, working with global challenges, working with a global mindset? And so the picture effectively builds from more narrow to much broader, and then you bring it back to me as a leader. So that is the design of the leadership processes that we embark on but the overriding working space is working in the here and now whilst I'm driving towards a goalpost and that I've in tune with the past so that I've harnessed the learning so that becomes the overriding process that we work with yeah. and it is it is a series of 12 sessions over the course of 12 months um have we gone through that there's a reflect um, so yeah. yeah, so we, we've, we've also taken the feedback around how busy people are and they can't give. So, you know, my leadership processes in person can be two days followed by another day a month later, followed by another two days a month later. For, so there's a lot of investment of time and a lot of people have spoken around we don't have time. And so taking that feedback, we've said, well, what if we make it punchier where you can create an insight 
for an hour and a half in a masterclass and two weeks later have a reflection session to think about what you learned and how it's stuck with you and how you're working with it so that we can make it punchier. People can commit to probably two and a half hours a month. Um, and then it becomes a sacred space that I'm investing in so that I can be more successful and I suppose respond to opportunities as they present. So that's it, guys. All right. Well, we've run out of time and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for joining this morning and thank you for your time. And if there are any other questions or comments, then you're more than welcome to email us, let us know. Um, but have a very good weekend everybody keep warm for those in the uk and um keep hydrated keep cool yeah <laughs> keep hydrated and um we'll hopefully speak to you soon thank you guys thanks for the time thank you right. take care